Of all the great figures in psychology, perhaps Sigmund Freud is the most important. We all speak Freud. Every time we, uh, we turn around and say, oh, he's so anal, or uh, that person is a control freak, or uh, talk about Freudian slips, or even speculate about the meaning of our dreams. He was an intellectual, he was an eccentric. At times, he was an abuser of substances. I think history has been complex in its relation to Sigmund Freud. He's both valued and devalued. He's idealized and he's denigrated. In 1938, during the last year of his life, Sigmund Freud was old and sick, but his mind was still sharp. I discovered some important new facts about the unconscious. Out of these findings, grew a new science, psychoanalysis. And with psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud opened the doors to the unconscious, forever changing the way we view the human mind. The late 1800s marked the end of the Victorian age, a period of extreme puritanical restrictions. Any expression of human sexuality was considered an outrage. Respectable women only went to their doctors with a chaperone. Personal matters were never discussed in polite society. Professional therapists didn't exist, and people with psychological problems had nowhere to go. Mental patients were treated like outcasts. They were put in asylums and received antiquated and in some cases even barbaric care. Treatments included alternating hot and cold baths, lengthy periods of drug-induced sleep, and in some cases, brain surgery that resulted in death. It was in the midst of this, in 1886, Dr. Sigmund Freud began treating patients with a simple but radical approach. He listened. Physicians of that day prescribed, but they didn't listen. They were the authorities. The patient was expected to, in effect, obey and listen to the doctor. Listening to a patient's life history was an entirely new development. Freud's goal was to get his patients to talk as much as possible about anything and everything. In Freud's office, no subject was taboo. But rather than interview them face to face, he had his patients lie on a couch turned away from him so that they would be more comfortable revealing their deepest thoughts. If his methods seemed peculiar, the theories behind them were even more outlandish. Sigmund Freud developed a revolutionary new way of thinking about the human mind. He introduced the idea of the unconscious. Freud believed that the unconscious is a place where we bury conflicts such as painful memories or unacceptable thoughts that we do not want to deal with. And this can make conscious life more difficult. He said the unconscious is the real us, buried down like the bottom of an iceberg. All we see is the tip of the iceberg above the surface of the ocean. That's the present day us. But what really makes us is the downstairs, the subconscious. We are driven by sexual desires, for example, uh, that lay dormant but are trying to somehow affect our behavior. Freud was convinced that if his patients could bring their repressed thoughts to the surface through conversation, they would have to confront them. This alone could diminish their anxieties and eventually relieve them of their symptoms. This central Freudian notion of the unconscious mind is the one that everyone has to deal with, whether they accept it or reject it. They cannot ignore it. There aren't that many ideas within the history of ideas that have that kind of, of uh, galvanizing power. At first, the mainstream medical community met Freud with scorn and derision. They labeled him a radical and revolutionary a description that suited him even as a child. Sigmund Freud grew up in a poor Jewish neighborhood in Vienna. As a boy, Sigmund was a brilliant, ambitious, and opinionated student. At school, 
I was always the bold oppositionist, always on hand when an extreme had to be defended. One could say that in a certain sense as we look at Freud's accomplishments that he was already at a very young age in a class by himself. At 17, Freud graduated high school and entered the University of Vienna to study medicine. Medicine was a good way for a young Jewish boy who was very bright to, to, make, to make a career for himself. But uh, Freud also clearly had a great deal of scientific curiosity. He always had, uh, from his youth, this kind of uh, questing. He would put himself a, a problem and then just go after it and, uh, until he solved it. In 1882, Freud began an internship at the General Hospital in Vienna, and for the next three years, he experimented with a number of different specialties, including neurology. Freud was consumed by his research, but the 26-year-old was also in love. It was during his internship that Freud met Martha Bernays, a lively, intelligent woman. Martha came from a good Austrian family. This was his great love, and he struggled to win her and to get together enough money to be able to marry her, and it's over several years that, that this unfolds. Only one thing stood in their way. Sigmund Freud was unknown. He would have to make a name for himself first. Freud redoubled his efforts at the hospital. He dreamt of making a discovery that would make him famous, wealthy, and benefit mankind. He soon pinned his hopes for fame and fortune on a little-known drug, which seemed to hold great promise as an anesthetic and as a treatment for exhaustion and depression. It was cocaine. Freud believed in cocaine so much that he began using the drug himself and even sent some to Martha. Freud said cocaine helped him relax in social situations and made him feel more like a man. You perceive an increase in self-control, more vitality and more capacity for work. This result is enjoyed without any of the unpleasant aftermaths which accompany exhilaration from alcoholic means. Anxious to capitalize on his discovery, Freud published a paper extolling the drug's virtues. But Freud deeply regretted his haste after the drug's addictive properties became known. It was a huge blow for Freud professionally. It was a source of great disappointment for Freud because he had hoped to be the discoverer of local anesthesia, cocaine being first used uh, effectively as a local anesthetic. It's possible that Freud even thought it had certain aphrodisiac qualities. 